Good morning, everybody. My name is Rick, and uh, that was some great organ music over there. I uh, want to welcome you all. Warm welcome here on this January Sunday. I want to welcome our web community. Um, today I'm here to uh, announce, or not announce, well, we all know about this mostly. The annual affirmation meeting is next Sunday with a snow date of the 31st. Now, I went ahead and looked at my seven-day forecast just to get a handle of it. They're saying only 11 to 17 on Saturday, so we should be fine. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Chris Gallison, and I'm the director of Christian Education. And in less than 24 hours, our doors will be open for Martin Luther King Jr. not a day off, but a day on day of services. So we're very excited about this. Last year we had over 110 people come and use our services and have breakfast and lunch here. We usually have around 30 to 40 youth going out in service projects and we have a whole, whole lot of volunteers and we can always use more. So if you're free tomorrow and you wanna stop in, we'd love to have you. As I have promised, I have three more, and these are your last interesting facts about Martin Luther King. I'm sure you're very upset that I won't have any next week. First of all, he dealt with extreme stress. When he was assassinated in 1968 while standing on a balcony outside his hotel room in Memphis, an autopsy revealed that while he was only 39 years old, this man's heart looked like that of a 60-year-old. He is the only non-president to have a national holiday in his honor. He's also the youngest male to have won a Nobel Peace Prize. After winning this prestigious award at age 35, he donated all of his prize money to the Civil Rights Movement. And last, and this won't be a big what for ya, he was jailed 29 times. I'm not surprised. Being charged with everything from speeding to acts of civil disobedience, Martin Luther King Jr. spent a fair amount of time in jail. Of course, jail time was an unavoidable occupational hazard for Dr. King, who is still regarded as one of the greatest nonviolent leaders in world history. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dori Rodner. I'm bringing news from our adult literacy program. And I have good news and I have bad news. The bad news is we had to cancel our training yesterday because of the weather. But the good news is that you now still have an opportunity next Saturday to come to the training and learn how to be a literacy volunteer. Um, and if the weather does not cooperate next Saturday, we will reschedule sometime in February. I haven't looked at the church calendar, but we will still have one, so don't fear. Hey there, I'm Heather. Um, quick plug for book club this week. People of the Book is what we're reading, and it is seriously one of the best books I've ever read. And I read it so fast, it's 600 pages, but if you started today, you could easily finish it by then, because it's a really quick read, because it's that good. So Tuesday, 6.30, next month is Glimpses um, at the Moon, or of the Moon, I can't remember, Glimpses at the Moon by Edith Wharton. Um, today is Patriot Sunday. <laughs> I mean, casual Sunday. Um, <laughs> I haven't ever had this much clothing on at church. Apparently it is actually warm in here. I, I didn't know that. Um, so after church today, after coffee hour, we're all gonna, go, whoever wants to go bowling, it's bowling Sunday too. So we're gonna gather together with Cheryl. She's up in the balcony, you guys know her, Cheryl Gray. Get together with Cheryl at the end. We're gonna get, she'll have us all organized. We'll go over to the bowling alley by 11.45 to vacation land. And then at noon is when we have our four lanes. Um, I think that's everything. I hope you guys can join us. Through the miracle of Perry, technology, I'm sorry. we have the opportunity to listen to an invitation. So here it goes, media booth. 
Parish, this is Chris. I'm sorry I'll miss you this weekend. I'm finishing up a class down here in Pennsylvania. But I'm coming to you with a really cool small group activity that's going to be starting at the beginning of February. It's going to take place on Wednesday evenings from 5.30 until 7.30 at night. What is it, you might ask? It's pretty exciting. It's going to be a book group on the story of God, the story of us. This is a meta-narrative by a husband and wife team, and we're going to be reading it over five weeks. Now, this is where you come in. I need five families or individuals to offer to open their homes for us the five weeks of our book study. After service today, you can sign up to volunteer to host us in your home with Tim Brown. If you would like to be a member of the group, I would also appreciate sign up, which can also be done with Tim Brown. So I hope to see you soon, and if you have any questions, please just email me. So Chris is in Pennsylvania following up her seminary experiences and wanted you to be invited to participate in that study and perhaps even a house to meet during the five weeks. How many people here this morning are here because someone has invited you to come? May I see the hands of those people who have been invited? Be wonderful. You who have said yes, thank you. Welcome to First Parish. It may not always be so crazy, but it moves in that direction on occasion. For those of you who invited those people, thank you. It is an important part of who we are. I hope you are all welcome. I hope that the Spirit of God touches you somewhere in the totality of our service. Let our choir bring us even deeper now into our worship time. Hallelujah. Arise, shine. No, really, arise, <laughs> shine. And let us share our voices in the call to worship found in our bulletin this morning. It's an adaptation from Psalm 40. Let us turn our hearts and minds to the presence of God in our midst. Let us lift our voices together in praise of the Holy One on this Sabbath morning we are invited to rest in the holiness of the day, to be refreshed and renewed and reinvigorated to serve. All thanks and praise be to God. We lift our voices in song.
invite our voices to be shared yet again in the unison prayer of invocation found in our bulletin. Let us say, one heart, one soul, one voice. God, who invites us to follow, we have gathered here faithfully in search of something. We are here as ones who have been called to bear witness. Help us in this hour to pay attention and give voice to the reality of your presence in our lives. Grant us the courage to hear and receive your word, that we may be forever changed by the one who offers us infinite possibilities, if only we come and see. Amen and amen. My friends, please be seated. Church school, please join me up front here. to sit down. Right there. Yeah, good. Make room. Excellent. All right. Whoop. And a whole slew of balcony dwellers. All right. Nice. Okay, I've got, I've got an easy question for you, I think. How many of you have ever been afraid so let me see the hands of any of you who have ever been afraid. Okay, um, can you tell me a, a time that you were afraid? What were you afraid of? Yeah. Yes, oh yeah, I remember that. In, in, in my room also, what you said, in my room when it was really dark. Yeah, Lizzie. Oh, yeah, going to the doctors and, and getting a shot. Oh, my goodness. Sure. Going where? Going into my mom's room alone. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> yes, yes. Remember the first bike ride and the wobbliness of it? Yeah, I, I got that. Okay, so almost all of us, almost all of us have had an occasion, a time when we were afraid of something. I have a picture here, and I don't know if you can see it. I have a picture here of something that I love, but there was a time when I was really, really, really afraid. And that time, was when I, it was at night, it wasn't this time of the picture, but it was at a time when we had just come out of a terrible storm, hurricane actually, and then at night when I was steering the boat, another thunderstorm came and knocked us over. We were way out in the ocean. We were a little tiny boat way out in the ocean, and I was sure I was absolutely positive that we were going to die. I was so afraid. I went out on the side of the boat and I lowered the, the sail so that we could come up again and we came up again and I just hugged the mast. And my friend Barry said, Doug, come on in. And I said, no, 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 no. He said, why? I said, I'm afraid. I'm going to stay right here hugging the mast. And then something happened. And what happened was like that, I became unafraid. I consider that a gift. All of a sudden, I knew, I just knew, that it was going to be all right. I don't know what to make of that. I've got a way that, that I can understand it. But it was a gift. And then I discovered, years later, I discovered that in the Bible, almost every time Jesus says something, it almost always starts with, do not be afraid. In fact, even before Jesus, the angels are talking to Mary, the angels are talking to the shepherds, the angels are talking to the wife, and, they, and the angels say, what? Do not be 
afraid. So I invite you, when you go into the dark room, when you're preparing to have the shot, when all those things that you may be afraid of, remember, God says to us, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Fear is a liar. Do not be afraid. Okay? Now, ordinarily, right here, right now, I would send you down to your classes, but I have a special treat for you. I would like you to listen to our choir because they have something to share with all of us. So listen. <clears throat> And I invite the church school down to the classes at this time. This morning's scripture lesson comes from the second chapter of John's Gospel in the New Testament. You may find it on page 80 in the New Testament section of your pew Bible if you wish to follow along. John tells the story of Jesus' first miracle. Now, it's, you may ask yourself as you're listening to this, 
why it was included in the, the gospel since it didn't have anything to do with healing anybody but it was something that Jesus did at a social occasion. Jesus did an extravagant piece of hospitality at a wedding in Cana of Galilee and John recorded it in his gospel. Listen now for God's word as it's recorded by the Apostle John. On the third day after Jesus called Philip as one of his disciples, there was a wedding at Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus and his disciples had been invited. When the wine failed, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Mother, what does that have to do with you and me? My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he asks you. Now there were six big stone jars standing there for the Jewish rites of purification. Each of them held 20 or 30 gallons. He told the servants to fill them with water, and they filled them to the brim. Then Jesus said to the, uh, the servants, draw some of the water and take it to the chief steward. When they did, the chief steward tasted the water that had now become wine but he did not know how it had become wine. And he called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the best wine first and save the inferior wine till the guests are all drunk. But you have saved the best for last. While well, this was the first sign that Jesus did at Cana of Galilee, and he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is God's word as brought to us by the Apostle John. There is a colleague of mine, <clears throat> uh, because of the glare, oh, there he is, he's sitting over there. Um, a colleague of mine who uses a phrase which is, I think, appropriate here, and he says there are certain purchase points. That is to say, in any given scripture, there, there is a purchase point where you can build on or jump off from and, and have certain glimmer. Well, there are a number of different purchase points that Carlton just shared with us. Could be, <clears throat> could be the miracle itself, that in itself would be enough for a, a whole kind of conversation. One of the other purchase points might be the curious exchange and what it reveals about the relationship between Mary and Jesus. I mean, I heard a little bit of twittering out here when, when Jesus responds to Mary. And it seems to me that I have some experience about a mom laying some responsibilities on a son. And I want to say, oh, mom, you do whatever he says, says Mary. So, so there's a purchase point possibility for that kind of relationship. And then there's that whole almost petulant response from Jesus himself. What does this have to do with me or you? Does that sound like the Jesus we know? So there are a number of different purchase points where we can, we can begin to, to build upon. But I want to give you a little bit of a backstory to the scripture you just heard. Because it is, after all, in John, the inaugural miracle story. 
Whenever I do a wedding and go to the reception and don't you know often get asked to offer a prayer, I always refer to this scripture that the first miracle in John, the first miracle that, that Jesus does is where? At a wedding. And there's something special about that kind of setting. How many here have been in recent memory, or perhaps amnesia has taken over, have, have ever planned for a wedding for a son or a daughter? Okay, so some of you can begin to appreciate the role of the father in this story. We don't hear much about him, but the fact of the matter was that a wedding at that time was not a one-day deal. It was a week long, a week. Now multiply what you experience times that number. Okay, you're beginning to get a sense of it. Not only that, in our times of weddings, family and friends are, are gathered. One of those rare times in our lives where both family and friends get together. <clears throat> well, at that wedding, the whole village was present and invited and expected to be there. The whole village was expected to be there for a week of celebration of a wedding. Can you begin to get a sense of the magnitude of the social faux pas when the wine ran out? The expectation was that the wine would be there. The expectation was the good wine would come out well, we've got a little different thing going on here. We have a story of a miracle, and one of the catch lines, one of the purchase points in that has to do with the praise received for the reversing of the common expectation. And that leads me to share with you what a miracle is. Go through your scripture. Anytime you find a miracle, it is almost always, I'll even say always, the, not the incident itself that is most amazing. It's always what that incident points toward. Wine from water, pretty cool. But what is it pointing toward? A healing, wonderful. What is it pointing toward? Now, I say that to you because the point of fact is that when you look at those miracles in the Gospels, you will find that almost always Jesus says what? Don't tell anyone. Why? Because the miracle is not the point. It's what it points toward that is the real deal. A miracle always points toward something else. So, what does this miracle, this sign, this extravagant sign point toward? It points toward the kingdom of God as the divine reversal of the common expectation. The kingdom of God is the divine reversal of the common expectation. Now in this setting of the scripture that Carlton just shared with us, the dad, the father of the bride, for sure dark times were his. The social embarrassment that was threatening this celebration, week-long celebration, where the entire village is to be present, would be talked about for generations. Oh, do you remember when old Josiah had a wedding and the wine ran out? Oh, that's what he was faced with. But the common expectation was turned into an extravagant sign of the kingdom of God. Who can doubt? Who amongst us can doubt that we, today, right now, each of us, all of us, are like the father of the bride because we too, in a variety of ways, personally, collectively, are in dark times. Of course, now I wrote this before the Patriots won. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but our internet and our newspapers and our stations on television will confirm the fact that we all know that we are in dark times as well. And yet, and yet, as people of faith, we know. I mean, we know, we really, really know, in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And that led him to proclaim, to know, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Water into wine. Extravagant sign of the kingdom of God. When and whenever the common expectation is reversed, turned upside down, whenever that happens, the extravagant sign of the kingdom of God <gasps> begins to look like the peaceable kingdom that is right now and not quite fully yet. The peaceable kingdom. Whenever that extravagant sign is in our midst and the tables get turned, the kingdom is being pointed toward. When that common expectation is reversed, when the kingdom is revealed, that peace is not merely a distant goal, that peaceable kingdom. It's not only a sense of having that old adage, the old law about an eye for an eye is seen as leaving everybody blind. We know that, and yet we continue to go down a road where we do as others have done unto us, or even preemptively do it before they do it unto us. We know that that's not the way to go. We know that love prevails. We know we are called to a different way of living and being an extravagant sign for the coming of God. We know that as we begin to take that seriously and live in such a way, we know what happens. And what happens is that the enmity, the eneminess, between people begins to diminish. We know that the enmity between males and females, between blacks and white, between Jews and Palestinians, between Hutus and Tutsis, between conservatives and liberals, between Democrats and Republicans, between real Mainers and everyone else, <laughs> between all of our isms begin to be overcome. Extravagant sign, indeed. But as you heard me say before, Christianity is not for the faint of heart. There are dangers around us as we begin to dare to live into that extravagant sign way of living. There are dangers, and those dangers sometimes affect us. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but it's rather the silence by the good people. You see, do you see that our very souls are at stake? He said that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter like the vast economic inequities that bring great suffering, like the variety of injustices that are heaped upon a people, or the variety of privileges that are accrued by others, simply by virtue of skin pigmentation, gender identification, religious or sexual preferences. Oh yeah, there's a lot at risk. In the end, says Martin Luther King, in the end, we may well remember not the words of our enemies, 
but the silence of our friends. And so it is on this Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday in the scripture of Jesus' extravagant witness, extravagant sign of the way the kingdom radically turns up and over all of our common expectations. On this Sunday, as it was with Jesus, who apparently needed to be reminded by his mother, the time is always right to do what is right. You'll hear a lot of commentators talk about the dream and whether the dream has died or whether we fulfilled the dream or whether the dream needs, you'll hear all of that. Remember that the time, says Martin Luther King, the time is always right to do what is right. And so I pray and I plead, be the extraordinary sign. Take the water of your life and let it be turned into good wine that is served up immediately. Let it be the extravagant sign of the coming of the kingdom of God that you can help participate in and co-create an extravagant sign of the kingdom of God. Let it be so. Amen. Friends, please be seated. As the deacons prepare to bring the microphones to those of you who would choose to share a prayer of joy and celebration, care, concern, compassion, as they are preparing for that, let me share with you some names of people who have been in my heart of prayer for this past week and beyond, actually. And you will know some of these names and others you will not, but you will know the journey they are on, whether it be for physical wholeness and healing, whether it be release from the chains of addiction, whatever their personal circumstances, you will know that it is your journey as well. And the invitation is to surround them with a healing light of God. These names that you may not know, like Pat Plummer. Pat is a woman who gave great encouragement to my wife Karen in her journeys through chemotherapy. She herself now enters the final weeks of her life. For Jim Blood, brother of Phil, who continues his journey with cancer. For Jim Sterling and Rosemary Worth, way out on the left coast. For Dale's father, Adam, for Kristen Larkin, for Cynthia and Catherine, for Paul Stickney, for Alyssa McRae, and for Heather Bissell, all of their journeys struggling and or challenging, that they might be held in our prayers for grace, and courage, and comfort. 
So those are the persons, those are the prayers that I've held. I invite the deacons to come about halfway down. And when you have a prayer, please let it be known immediately by the raising of your hand so that we can get to you. Now, typically, we start with Adria, but just because this is a special Sunday, I'm going to come down here and speak with Linda first, and then maybe we'll get back to Adria. Prayers of caring and healing and hope for Lucy Bertrand. Lucy. Lucy Bertrand. Thank you, Linda. Sure, thank you, Troy. Lou? My sister Nancy is going in on Wednesday for a total knee replacement, and she is scared to death. So prayers of healing and um, comfort uh, are needed for her. And I start my, uh, another semester starts on Tuesday at uh, Southern Maine Community College. I'm taking two classes. At the end of that, I'll have one class, and by Christmas time, I will have my mental health rehabilitation <laughs> tax certificate so I can move on in my career. Great. Great Christmas gift. Um, and when you speak with Nancy, tell her what I told the kids today. Fear is a liar. Merle? And then, Adria, I will keep my promise. We'll get back to you. I promised uh, our neighbor, Cindy, that we would lift up her parents in prayer. Her mother is suffering from uh, descending into the dark of dementia, and her father has had some of his lower portions of his lower leg removed for diabetes, and they're kind of, they're being really challenged right now. Thank you, Merle. Well, okay, it's easier. Sure, Marge. No, thank you. Uh, ongoing prayers for Don Skelton. Thank you, Marge. Don Skelton and all the challenges for a man who has a beautiful heart, even as that heart is challenged. Adrian. Uh, prayers of celebration for my friend's son, Logan, who celebrated his third birthday on Wednesday, and we weren't always sure he was going to get there. Um, and prayers of healing for my friend's niece, Mallory, who is two and was recently diagnosed with leukemia. <coughs> They're having a benefit for her this coming Saturday, so. Prayers of God's intended healing and wholeness for all. I feel like I'm leaving out this side, so per perhaps if you could start. Prayers of comfort, please, for the Willett family of Saco who lost a daughter this week. For that family, for the way the world is considerably different than it was just even a short time ago, we offer our prayers. All the way down with um, Robert. I have two prayers of gratitude, maybe it's one. Um, I'm grateful to God for the life and witness of Dr. King. But I'm also grateful for parents who lived in such a way that I learned to judge people by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. Amen. Linda? Here, is there one person in here that doesn't think that that choir knows how to sing? What about good looking? They are the best looking choir I have ever seen. Can we stand up and give them a little clap? Come on. <laughs> Absolutely. Amen to that. Jane? Um, um, prayers for our friend Maggie, whose brother is um, in the last days of cancer. Mm. And um, prayers of hope for people that struggle with mental health and substance abuse. Yes. Thank you, Jane. Amen. Rick? Yes, I want to offer a prayer of celebration to, uh, to have uh, this invitation Sunday, the first of many, I hope, uh, and uh, welcome to all those who are here. Prayers of joy and thanksgiving, absolutely, for those who have been invited and were silly enough to say yes. Oh. Wow. 
Prayers uh, from the web community, Jack. From Fred and Carol, prayers for Neil as he battles cancer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my friends, in a way that makes sense to you, in a way that is right and true for your spirit, in a way that might include a bowing of head, a clasping of hands, an opening of your heart, a deepening of your breathing, however you enter into prayer. I invite you to do so. Let us pray. Most glorious and gracious God, on this beautiful day, filled with blessings more than we can name, we pause to give you thanks for the very breath of life itself, for the way that our journey has brought us to this moment with all of its twists and its turns, with its verities and varieties, with all the vagueness and vitality. Gracious God, thank you. Here we are now. Wow. For the people that have helped us along the way. For those close to us who have given us birth, raised us up, kept us on the path. Gracious God, for those people, thank you. And in a curious twist of our faith, thank you even for those who have been difficult in our lives, for we are who we are because of them also. For the desire to be instruments of your peace, for the desire to add our prayers among the prayers of everyone, to your awareness, common thinking, hoping, dreaming, believing, for prayers of healing and wholeness, for prayers of courage in the face of challenge, for prayers of joy and the celebrations that are rightly ours, for all of this, we give you thanks. Oh, gracious God, hear us as we sing the prayer of your Son.
the joy of the faith is to participate in the community in a common act that is ritual in the rightest sense, the ritual of giving. That ritual which goes deep into us, recognizing the blessings of our lives and erupts from us in generosity for the blessing of others. So I invite you with joyful participation in this ritual of offering at this time. and gracious God, we offer these gifts in these plates, in these pews, in the basket behind me. We offer all of this out of the joy of our living, out of the hope and the promise of these gifts being magnified by the power of your love, that they may accomplish things we can barely dream of, that these gifts given in your Son's name may accomplish a little taste a little touch of the kingdom. <clears throat> Gracious God, we offer these with joy. Amen. <laughs>
bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. And, and, as you go forth from this place, you're going out into a world that desperately needs to hear the good news. Go forth with the good news. Go forth with the good news that you are loved by God and that every child of every persuasion is equal to that love of God. Go forth with that power. Go forth with that purpose. Go forth with God's peace. Mm -hmm.